in the course of many years that I have preached on this Holy Gospel and on this feast day, only recently did I realize that the Holy Family is like us. I know the pictures we see of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are always cleaned up and tidy. Everybody has a halo. Everybody's sort of pleasantly smiling at each other. Uh, Jesus is dutifully helping his dad in the carpentry shop. Mary is donning something in the corner. And of course, she's praying. And I always felt that was really nice, but out of touch for my family anyway. But yet, the Holy Family is a model that God has given us to follow in our own families. And I think if we examine the real authenticity of the Holy Family, we'd probably be able to identify more with them on a human level and then aspire to join them on a spiritual level. You know, Jesus had ancestors, you know. Joseph had ancestors. Mary had ancestors. And if we were to trace the family tree of Jesus, we saw he has some skeletons in his closet. Some of the greatest people that you know, biblical history, ancestors of Jesus, were terrible, were sinners. David, the great King David, was an adulterer. He sent his favorite captain out in the front guard to fight a battle so that he could have the guard's wife. This is an ancestor of Jesus. We don't know what was Joseph's mother and father's reaction to the fact that he's marrying a girl who's already pregnant. Was, she, was he blackballed by the family? I don't know. Luke certainly did include that in the gospel. But we know it was a dangerous situation because of the law of the Jews that indeed, except for the fact that it was inspired by God and the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, she could have very well been taken out of town and stoned to death. See, the Holy Family is really like our families. We have skeletons in our closet. I'm not going to reveal too many, but we have skeletons in our closet, don't we all? And, and think of the old lady in the, in the church, Anna. There's always an old lady in church. No one, no one here, of course. You're not old enough to be an old lady in church. But there's always an old lady in church praying all the time. And I identify with my grandmother, Celeste. She had a place third row, right side, in her parish, Holy Rosary, in Jersey City. That's where she went every day. When I was a child, small, like, like Timka's size, I would go with her to church. That's where I learned what confession was. This is, this is the old lady in my family, not a prophetess. And I said one day to Grandma, what's that, what's that, that room with the, with the cloth over it and the door in the middle? It was a confessional. She said, oh, that's the way, that's the way you tell the priest you sin. I said, you tell the priest your sins? I didn't know I had sins. I was a kid. And she says, oh, yeah. She says, um, I said, well, how do you do that? She said, well, I go in. I said, blessed me, Father, for I know sin. I know killing nobody. I know sleeping with nobody but my husband. And I pray every day. Oh, I said, that's what sin is, huh? Telling God how wonderful you are. The prophetess, Anna is not telling anybody else but Jesus how wonderful he is. So there is sort of identification with all of us, and we all have one of those people in our family. We all have children in our family, my nieces and nephews, your own children, that you hear praises about. I mean, come on, this has happened to all of us. You come home, and you're, you're as a kid, you're in trouble, you don't take the trash out, you don't dry the dishes, you don't do your homework on time. And then you meet with the teacher who loves your son or daughter. Your son is such a good kid in class. He gives so much of his time. He always erases the board. He dumps the trash. He collects for the poor in class. And, you know, you, you hear and you go home and you, and you say, is that my son or daughter that that teacher was talking about? 
So we all have that in our family tree. And then there's the old Irish story of this man who was kind of mean, kind of liked the drink, and eventually he dies. At the funeral home, the mother and her sons are sitting there, and people are coming up, going to the, the pool, and coming over to her and say, oh, Mrs. McGillicuddy, your, your husband was wonderful. We loved him at work. Somebody else would come up and say, oh, Mrs. McGillicuddy, he was so generous with people. He gave uh, uh, until we all had enough. And, and the compliments kept coming to her about the guy in the coffin. And she says to her son, tell me now, Luke, go up and see who's in the box up there. <laughs> see, people always talk about us, not always bad, but they talk about us to other people even when they like us. And then when the reality comes, we show up at home, we're just ourselves. And to heal that, we have a recommendation today in the scriptures, how not to be your nasty selves. And all of us have that little streak in us. At times when things go well, I was with dinner of my nephew the other day, and we we're talking about family traits, and he says, um, no one in our family except, he named a few, are, are mean. And I say, yeah, some people are mean, but, and he says to me, uncle, you're never mean. You're sarcastic at times, but you're never mean. And you know what? He hit it on the head. I have nothing to be mean about. Don't cross me, but I'm not mean, ever. <laughs> I got that trait from my mother, and she was as good as gold, but don't cross her. We, we knew where the boundary was. You see, and that's what Jesus, Mary, and Joseph's family was all about. You think Jesus swept the shop after the father worked on a bench and cleaned up all the sawdust? Please. He was subject to them because he was their child in a very patriarchal system. So, of course, he did what he was told to do because he would have probably got a little whack. Oh, how would Joseph have whacked Jesus after he knew that he was the son of God? He, he didn't get a full consciousness of it. You think when Jesus was growing up, he, he walked around with a halo? You think when Jesus was walking around, his parents genuflected in front of him because he was the son of God? I'm sure they were so confused but trusting that's the key. So confused as to who this kid is. A messenger says uh, to Mary, I'm, you're going to have a baby and he's going to be called son of God? Well, I mean, in my family, we were two boys and my mother thought both of us were the sons of God and nobody could go, do anything against us because we were special. But that's a different kind of son of God. That's, that's, that's my mother's version. But Mary, she had the son of God. She gave birth to the Son of God. How could that have sunk into her head when she gives birth to the Son of God, the creator of the universe, in a stable? Please. Confusion? She must have had her share of confusion. Like all of us in our lives, as we go on our journey of life, is, should I do this or should I do that? And you know, as well as I do, if you have prayed for a decision and you've made the decision, that's the right decision. Why? Because if we unite our own souls, our own spirituality to God, and we do his will, then his will becomes our will. Doing what's right in the name of God, even sometimes if it's challenging, even, even if it's sometimes traveling at a distance. Here's another one. Joseph and Mary travel at a distance away from where they were living. You think their parents enjoyed that? You're taken up with this guy, you, you barely know, you were betrothed to him, and all of a sudden you're married to him, and you're going to his homeland? You think Mary's mother, Santa Anna, was happy about that? You think Joachim was happy about letting his little girl go, who's pregnant, by the way, on a camel or a donkey on the hillsides of Galilee? No. Did they love her and let her go? Yes. And when your kids get old enough and they go to college, you're not going to enjoy that necessarily, 
unless it's Timco and you want to push him out quicker. <laughs> I'm only joking, Timco. And what happens when we separate from those we love? We're hurt. But because we love them, we let them go. And if those of us who have not followed our conscience in, in raising our family members, nieces, nephews, parents, the scriptures are here to help us. The book of Sirach is a book of, of intelligent phrases. It was a book of wisdom, they call it, because it was, it was written from the perspective of believers in the covenant with God. But it was written in a society that didn't believe. Huh, it sounds like our own society. Society en masse, the group of it, the world view of it, nah, God's not so hot. Us, within the society, yes, God is number one. And that's always our goal, to evangelize and to bring God's word forward by our actions and by our prayer life and by how we treat one another and what we say. So, Sirach gives us an instruction today. How to take care of each other in the family. And nobody gets a, a free reign. No, nobody gets off scot-free. Fathers, don't aggravate your sons. Now, how many sons and daughters have said, oh, he aggravates me. And, and, and in a temper, some kids have said, oh, I hate my father or my mother. Kids do that. And probably all of us maybe thought of it as if we didn't say it when we were, own, when we were children. Because they disciplined us. But Sirach is saying, no, don't aggravate your children because they're following you. You're the role model. They are going to be firmly planted roots of your family. He says to the father also, honor your children. Of course, children absolutely honor your mother and father, but sometimes it's reversed. And I, as a family therapist, very often I see families in my office and the parent is nasty and the parent is rude and the parent is mean. And that shows no respect for the child. So that's a challenge for me because then my goal in, a, in my sessions is to put them, put them on track. Because they're people. They're little people, but they're people. And we need to respect our children, and we need, we need to respect our elderly. And respect does not mean giving them free reign, spoiling them, not watching over them. No, respect means proper discipline, balance between love and chores. And then he tells us how to take care of our elderly. Respect them. And if their minds go a little off, Alzheimer's or, or, or another illness, dementia, no, you respect them. They did their job. They raised you. They raised the family. And you remember that. And you show them the respect because God is gladdened. God is happy when you are challenged to, and I did this to my father, to feed my father when he was in the nursing home. That's a challenge that none of us want to face, to walk your father to the men's room or to s feed him soup or to bring his favorite dish of pasta, which is what my brother's job would always, here, give this to dad. And here we are, the children taking care of the elderly. Nothing new. We don't have to be, have a title of millennial or anything like that. No, it was in the book of Scripture. It's in Sirach. How to take care of one another. How to respect the elderly and the young. And, of course, the more we honor them, the more we bring ourselves dignity. Now, now listen to this. It's not that we're giving them honor and praise. That's, that's automatic. But we're honoring and praising ourselves when we show honor and respect to the elderly or the infirm. Why? Because we're members of the body of Christ. The more good I do for one person, the more God is blessing me. And I don't do it to get blessed. I do it because it's my mandate as a Christian to love as Jesus loves us. And when that person receiving our love is a parent or a relative, 
And we do it even though it's harsh. And there are a lot of mean people out there. And it's hard, hard to be nice to them sometimes. Hard to be respectful of them sometimes. And unless they're really, really, really toxic, they, they're still part of the tree, the family tree. And some people who are really toxic have been lopped off from the family tree as a branch, usually by their own doing. So it's not easy. This is not a, 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 a bowl of cherries that the scriptures have given us today. And that experience of Jesus and Mary bringing the kid into the church, into the temple, wow, that must have been so exasperating. All that she did, Mary, all that she did to bring this kid into the world and traveled with Joseph, the, the, the reputation that was on, this, on the line. And now your reward, Mary, listen to this, your reward, Mary, is that a sword is going to pierce your heart because of this kid. This kid, Jesus Christ, is going to be the cause of the rise and downfall of many. See, it's not an easy ride because they have that picture of the Holy Family all neat and clean in their, in their workshop. No, the Holy Family is like our family. The ups and downs, the ancestors that are dubious, the ancestors that, that are bones in the closet, skeletons in the closet. Yeah, they're like us. They're like us. I'm going to presume one thing, though. I'm going to presume that when Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians, he knew of the Holy Family. He knew of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. If not firsthand, at least secondhand. I don't know if he knew Mary. He met Jesus in that vision on his way to, to Damascus. He may have known Mary. He may have known Joseph. He may have known the, the relatives. So when Paul writes to us, oh, by the way, it says Colossians no, it's us. This letter is to us. How to get up in the morning and how to prepare for my day as a family member. Get dressed by putting on humility, compassion, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another, forgiving one another. It's a lot easier to put a scarf, or even these days of COVID, a mask, than to put those characteristics on, which mean prayer. Before we do it, we need to pray. When we wake up and we have things in our hearts against someone in our family or our neighbors or people we work with, pray. Because that's the only way these characteristics are going to be ours, to put up with one another. Because over all these things, Paul is telling us, put on love. And you know what love is, of course, but think of how we talk about love evangelically. God is love. So above all these things, and all these things that we're working on, and as we get it up in the morning and we prepare ourselves to face the day, put on over everything God and his love for us in giving us his only son to be a role model of our family, along with Mary and Joseph. So to all of you, happy family day. Enjoy your families, struggle with them, but be real with them, as real as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were with each other.